Thank you, Steve, for to sing this morning, Bob, for the good prayer. And appreciate so much your presence today. What a beautiful Lord's Day that we have to come together to worship God. And always thankful for the sunshine. And, you know, it reminds me of Psalm 118, verse 24, where David said, This is the day which the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. And it's easier to rejoice on a sunny Sunday, for sure. If you have your Bibles this morning, I encourage you to go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And we're going to look at, at a story uh, that takes place. When I say story, it's, it's just an event that happens in, in the life of Paul um, and Silas. And it's, it's an event that, that really sheds some light upon um, kind of what was taking place at the time. Um, in Acts 16, Paul and Silas are uh, they're out and about, and they run across this lady that's got uh, the ability to tell fortunes. Or so people think. She actually has um, this spirit of divination, uh, which it's kind of demonic possession is what she had. And she was making money for her masters, and she was seeing Paul and Silas, and in Acts chapter 16, um, in verse 17, it says that she followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are these men are the servants. Of the Most High God was showing to us the way of salvation. Well, typically that would be a good thing for somebody to be following Paul and Silas and and and, and telling them or telling other everybody else that hey, these men are servants of the Most High God. Problem was this lady here because she was a soothsayer. Um, you had the Jewish people who didn't believe anything she said. Because they looked down upon her, they knew that it was demonic in nature. Uh, so they didn't want to listen to what she had to say. You had the Gentiles who, uh, they also didn't believe everything that was taking place. And with her being the spokesman, that was not good for Paul and Silas. It was not good for them uh, to have her going around telling everybody uh, that they were representatives of God. So in verse number 18, she did this many days, but Paul finally, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their uh, gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace and to the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. The multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Man, you would think that they killed somebody. You would think that they had done some kind of atrocious deed to be actually um, be scourged and then to be put into the innermost parts of the prison and having their hands and feet bound. It, it's interesting that because of, of the world, world's pleasure here, them, them actually making money off of somebody in fortune telling, because of that, because of the, he had taken away that spirit, You've got this man, he's so upset, the, the, the ones who were handling this lady, that they brought them to the magistrates and they are able to obtain warrants, uh, whatever you want to call it, and they were able to get them arrested. It's ridiculous. But that's not where the story ends. Because what ends up happening, now they're inside of a prison. And, you know, typically, I, and I've never been to jail, I've never been to prison, not actually as a prisoner. I've been there to, to study with people and to see people and those kinds of things. But to actually be in prison, you would think that they would be kind of down and out, wouldn't they? I mean, you're depressed because you've been doing God's work and here you are, you're stuck in prison. But that, that's one of the great things about this story. The very next verse you find at midnight, what are they doing? They're singing praises and praying unto God. What kind of attitude did Paul and Silas have? They had the attitude of gratitude, didn't they? 
they loved what God was doing for them, and they looked at situations as opportunities. That's hard to do. By the way, if you missed class this morning, you missed a good class. John is doing such a good job with our class. And starting out in the book of James, is starting about trials, and how that we are to be counted all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Well, Paul and Silas fell into a, to a difficult situation. And they are counted joy. And by the way, don't lose um, sight of the fact that they were beaten. So they were scourged, they were beat before they were ever put into prison. And yet, here they are going through all these trials, and what are they doing at midnight? Why aren't they sleeping? Why aren't they moaning and groaning and complaining? No, they're singing praises, and they're praying to God. The attitude of gratitude. I know you've heard that several times, but it's true. We need to be thankful for what we have. Even when we're going through trials and tribulations, be thankful. And that's what Paul and Silas are doing. And they're looking for opportunities to do more. They're not giving up. Man cannot shut them up. Man cannot scare them enough. They can't intimidate them enough. They're not going to stop telling the truth about Jesus. Hey, that's, that's a good example for us. We should never stop telling the truth no matter what. No matter who intimidates us, no matter who, who decides that if you tell the truth here, we're going to put you in jail. So, Jesus says, do not be afraid of them which are able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him, Matthew 10, 28, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's only one person, one being rather, that we need to be fearful of that can destroy our soul. And that's God. Therefore, when we serve Him, it doesn't matter what man thinks. It don't really matter at all what they think. Because I'm not trying to please men, I'm trying to please God. Paul and Silas, in their journey here, they are pleasing God. And in doing so, they're bringing people to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter to them what, if, if any, you know, how mad people get. They don't care who they offend. But Johnny, they didn't live in the PC society. And that's true. But I tell you, I hadn't been beaten in a long time. I don't know if I've ever been beaten. I don't know, I got pretty good weapons as a kid. But I've never been beaten from a faith. And until that happens, I don't know what's holding us back from telling the truth. From sharing the truth. And when you look at this story here, here you got these two guys that are in the middle of midnight. They are they're happy. Why? Because they're serving the Almighty God. They trust the one that they serve more than, than the world that they live in. You know, I, as, our, as a Christian, our thoughts need to be thinking about things above. We need to set our affections on things above, Colossians tells us. We need to think about that. Our heart, our soul, our desires need to be things above, not things really here upon the earth. We need to be thinking about what's coming. You know, what, what can I do to, to cause the kingdom or help the kingdom of God grow? What, what, what can I do as a Christian to influence somebody else to become a Christian? That's what Paul and Silas are doing. Keep reading. Verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were loosed. The keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out a sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Which is exactly what he, I hate to say what he should do because if he lost these prisoners, he was going to, he was going to eventually be killed he could have been tortured for days before he actually would have been killed. Because he would give him charge, straightly charged to take care of these prisoners. Um, so he, he realizes that, hey, the doors are open, and he thinks that maybe everybody's escaped, so he's just going to take his own life. And Paul said, hey, do thyself no harm, verse 28, for we are all here. 
Nobody's escaped. Don't do nothing. Don't do anything silly. Then he called for a light in verse 29. He sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. He falls down before them and, and, and brought them out and says to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's the question. And, and that's the question that really all of us need to ask ourselves. Well, wait a minute, John. I'm already a Christian. Okay, I'll give you that. But you still need to be asking the question, what must I do to be saved? Now, in this situation, this man is not a Christian. This man has, does not know very... I, I doubt he knew very little at all about Jesus. I mean, he's in, he's in Philippi. How much had he heard about Jesus? Now, there was a church at Philippi. How much did this guy know? I don't know. But here's what I do know. Uh, in verse 31, when Peter, or I'm sorry, when Paul answers and says, he says, Believe on Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So he tells them, him and Silas tell him, listen, if you want to be saved, here's what you have to do. You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The very next verse he says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So they go home with him. And they begin to tell him about Jesus. They begin to teach him about Jesus and what Jesus has done, how he came to this earth, he died on the cross, and he was buried. He was resurrected from the dead and that how He ascended back to the Father. They tell Him about the, the teachings of Jesus. They teach Him the, the, the things about Jesus that He needs to know. Now, in this short period of time, do they have enough time to tell Him everything that there is to know about Jesus Christ? No. But they taught Him about who Jesus was and what His purpose was. And in so doing... And in telling them about telling him about Jesus, verse thirty three says he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his straightway. Definitely, verse thirty one it says, "Believe on Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved." And then in verse thirty two they teach him about Jesus, and in verse thirty three it says, "He and all his were baptized straightway." Who told him about baptism? Paul and Silas. Who told him what he needed to do to be saved? Paul and Silas. Why? Because he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And in so doing, they teach him the gospel plan of salvation. Not mankind's plan of salvation, but the gospel's plan of salvation. Where a man, if he wants to, to, to become a New Testament Christian, he must first hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You've got to hear about it before you can believe it, don't you? Yeah. So then, once you hear it, you believe it. This, this Philippian jailer, he was hearing the Word, and evidently, he believed it because that, of his obedience. But you've got to believe in what you hear. Believe to the point that you're willing to obey, that you're willing to do something about it. You ever had somebody tell you something that you kind of didn't believe and it really required some action on your part, but since you didn't believe, you didn't do no action? Well, this is different. This is a situation where if you believe it, you've got to do some action. Oh, you're saying, well, i got to do a work. I'm not saying anything about work. I'm saying you've got to do an action. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And once you believe that and realize the situation that you're in, you're willing to repent of your sins. I'm sorry. I, you know, what I've been doing is wrong. How I've been living is not right. I have not been giving the glory and the honor to God like I should, and I want to repent of my sins. Jesus said Luke 13, verse 3, I tell you, name, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. And Acts 17.30 talks about that at one time God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So, definitely repentance is part of it. And I know there are those who don't really believe in repentance, but it's strange. The Bible talks about it throughout. 
repenting of your sins. Well, what's that mean? Well, I'm turning. I want to change. I want to be different. Alright, if you want to do that, then you need to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because Jesus had said in Matthew 10, verse 32, that if you will confess my name before me, and I will confess your name before my Father, which is in heaven. What does that mean? Just say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe Him and I trust Him. That's not hard to do, is it? No, not really. It's not like you've got to run a marathon or something. That's not hard to do. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you believe in this book, you have to believe that. And then once you do that, then you are baptized for the remission of your sins. Not only in this passage here, but there are several passages throughout the book of Acts that you'll find that. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, these two others. But you'll find that people are baptized for the remission of their sins. And once that happens, they are added to the church, Acts 2.47. God himself adds us to the church. So when, when the man asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Well, here's what you got to do. And evidently that transpired in Acts chapter 16 and verse number 32. They tell him what it is that he needs to do. Well, by verse 30, um, 33, he carries them home, he washes their stripes, and he and his whole household are baptized. doesn't end there, does it? The story kind of ends. I mean, um, I mean, it goes on a little bit. But really, we don't know much about this keeper of the prison after this. But is that where it ends for man? Is that all man ever has to do is, is do what this Philippian jailer and his household did and then they're done? No. That's just the beginning. And that's why I said earlier the question, what must I do to be saved? It's important that we understand God has given us <clears throat> rules, regulations, that we can live by and He wants us to live by. And these, these rules and regulations, He wants to ride upon our heart. He wants to put them inside of us. Hebrews chapter 8, the Hebrew writer talks about that, how that... that He's going to give them a law that's going to be written in their hearts. That's what God wants to do with us. He wants to write these words and these, and these truths in our hearts. He wants us to be transformed and be different. Now, we still live in the world. We live around all kinds of, of worldly people. But we're to be different than the world. We are to, to, to challenge ourselves to be more like Jesus each and every day. You know, in Romans chapter 12, and verse number 1, he says, I beseech you therefore before God and the presence of my enemies that you walk, I'm sorry, that's Ephesians 4, verse 1, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called. He wants us to walk worthy of this vocation. Walk this Christian walk. In Romans 12, verse 2, he wants us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might prove what is that good, holy, and perfect will of God. When you think about what Paul and Silas went through, would you think that they were faithful Christians? I do. They were happy. They were excited that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name, just as others um, had been as well. They were singing and praising God at midnight. And in so doing, they had the opportunity to teach somebody about Jesus. I encourage you this morning as a church, especially the church here at Kim, I encourage you to use every opportunity to teach other people about Jesus. I heard a lady, I was, I was listening, uh, she it was kind of some kind of prophetic stuff that she was talking about and she said you know she said I really think that we are one minute till midnight before Jesus returns you know I don't know if that's not true but I don't know that it is true I don't know I don't know when Jesus is coming back but I tell you there are a lot of weird things happening today but there's always been a lot of weird things happening 
But here's the point. Today we are one day closer to His return than we were yesterday. It may be tomorrow, it may be today, it may be a hundred years from now. I don't know when He's coming. But here's the point. We need to be ready, and we need to have as many people around us ready as we can. We need to get people ready and by telling them about Him. I mean, you go back to, to what is said in verse 31 of Acts 16. He says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. As long as everybody believes, as long as, as, long as everybody is obedient, they're going to be saved. What happens to those who don't? What happens to those who don't believe? What happens to those who aren't ever uh, obedient and becoming Christians? What happens to those who have been Christians who walk away from God? What happens to them? Jesus said in Matthew 25 that He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are on the right hand. That's the ones who have been obedient, the ones who have continued to be obedient and have followed Him. Unto them He will say, Come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. To those on the left hand, which are the goats, who... Those who have never obeyed or those who had obeyed but then went back to the world, he's going to tell them, Depart from me, ye cursed. And the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 41. Nobody wants to hear that. <clears throat> and I hope that you're like me this morning. That there's nobody in your family you hope hear that either. I hope in your mind you're thinking, Hey, I've got, you know, I've got family members here, i got family members there, and I need to start talking some more. Just a little plus sign. There might be family members you've talked to in the past that have turned you down, that have shut you down. Don't think they're going to shut you down again. At least take the opportunity. And if they shut you down, what have you lost? If they don't shut you down, what have you gained? You gained a lot. Paul and Silas, they showed themselves as great Christian examples here. And here they are in a bad, in really a bad situation. But the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 28 that God makes everything work together for good to them that love God. They had an opportunity to teach a man in his household about Jesus. They took advantage of the opportunity. The man in his household obeyed Christ. This morning, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I encourage you to obey Christ. I encourage you to give your life to Him. Be willing to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him to be the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you weren't away, I encourage you to come home and make, make corrections. You can make correction. You can become a New Testament Christian. You need to come. Please come as we stand. And sing. <coughs>